it got serious. <laughs> <laughs> I would also say, I mean, one of the other things, oh, we should stop. Seeds, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but Seeds is a super cool program that the Ecological Society of America runs that is um, targeted in many ways at HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, um, but also areas that have really high poverty, that are areas in communities that are really interested in the, the cross connections between environmental justice uh, and social justice. And so they also have a big mentoring program and travel. And so they bring an amazing diversity of students both into ecology but also to the ESA meeting where they have a whole program for these students and pair them up with mentors. Which is the segue towards the next thing I was going to say, uh, <laughs> which is uh, the other thing I've learned, and oh god, I'm twice as old as all of you again, oh well, whatever, uh, is, is what is called host behavior. Um, because I'm, I'm super introverted, and so I had to really learn... What? What? <laughs> I, I don't want to call you a liar, but I... <laughs> I was no, I'm, I'm going to call you a liar on that one. <laughs> I, yeah, but, but there's, there's different flavors of introversion, too. Yeah, no, I totally believe you. Yeah. I'm a lot more, I would say, semi-extroverted online through Twitter and such than I am in real life. I'm pretty horrible yeah. mm -hmm. with meeting people in real life, so I was just kidding around. I know. I think, <laughs> most, believe that. I think most of us That's are like could have missed the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, so I had to learn how to be situationally extroverted, if you will. Uh, and part of that is what's called host behavior, where if you're in a group of people and you see somebody else that's on the edge hovering, like that looks like they would like to come in to your group, invite them in. Because, um, I mean, honestly, some of it is, I usually was that super awkward person at the edge. And I realized that by becoming the person that says, hey, come and join us. We're having an awesome time. You can contribute to this conversation that I helped in increase that circle. But also, that person standing on the edge is probably thinking, look at all the cool people. They know everything. I'm an imposter. Um, or I don't know those people. I don't know anybody here at this meeting. What am I going to do? And so by being the one that says, hey, come on over. It's cool. Come on. We'll give you a beer. Um, Okay, maybe not the beer, but that that's something that can be incredibly helpful to kind of breaking that first sort of tense moment and getting somebody involved. Hopefully, I don't know, you're all looking at me like I just made no sense whatsoever. Oh, well. No, it makes total yeah. sense. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I think we're all on this, the same point that we're all those people that at one point or still are in some circumstances, the ones sitting on the outside looking in and, and figuring out how to get up there without the awkward sidle up into the conversation and the fake laugh along. So Yeah, some of us know, call I that know I've school. That. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not even school. I mean, I, I'm the same way at conferences when I go or meetings mm. and stuff like that where I don't know, you know, my own team of people. So I, I can totally awkward. understand. <laughs> yeah, team awkward. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are, I actually am working on a t-shirt, yes, for Team Awkward. But the, the thing is, everybody really deep down inside is on Team Awkward. And so if you're the person that reaches out, then you automatically get to be the cool one. Which is like the That's only... That's a really nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go around inviting everyone to join my groups. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's also how, how, you, it's how you meet As Mark said, people. you don't give them the beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. They can buy me a beer for inviting them in. Come <laughs> <Right. laughs> over, buy me a beer. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think we're striking the wrong tone there. <laughs> okay, well, that's, and once again, we can edit this out, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I think this is great. That's, that's our running joke. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't this is the only thing that you've said that we can actually put on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I mean, we put everything else on. I think this is. <laughs> 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 
in, including, so, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jacqueline actually hasn't listened to the podcast, or she never would have come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's little, what we I'm rely on for guests. Little, I'm a little behind on my podcast right now because I, I'm not sitting in front of a microscope for like 12 hours a day. So um, that was when I was doing a lot of my podcast listening. But I, I've, t- I've actually had to sit down and think about l- like exercises that I could do in, in my everyday life that would allow me to listen to more podcasts. So what are you doing at the moment, Jacqueline? What, what is your current day-to-day project? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm writing up some of the stuff, some of the stuff for my dissertation, um, as I am also ramping up, um, my postdoc project, which I'm, I'm looking up, uh, or I'm, I'm looking into, uh, there, so there have been some recent critical thresholds papers that have come out in some high profile places, um, and, uh, in terms of like, how can we, what are, what are some of the early warning detection systems that we can use in the ecological record to identify the imminent approach of a critical threshold, which sounds suddenly like I'm working with the Department of Defense, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually not, but what's really funny money. about- You should go yeah, for funding. Seriously. Um, what's yeah, funny if there's about, a giant extinct mammoth attack, they need someone on board. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, all the mammoths well, are totally You're totally <laughs> the scientist character in the movie, right? <laughs> Yeah, the mammoths are bearing true. down on LA, and all of a sudden you're there, you know, with your. I'm like, coat. save the samples. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to be that person, actually. Um, no, but so, uh, so just just yeah. to put in context, you so you finished your PhD last year. No, uh, this, year? this in, yeah, in August or no, July. Yeah. July of la- last year. Uh, no, this year. Or this this year. Okay, okay. July, July of this 2012. year. Twenty twelve. Yeah. And now you have a tenure track <laughs> position. I, so you've been I, doing a postdoc for six months ish, five uh, months ish. August since August, yes. Yep. <laughs> and okay, you landed I, a job. I'm sorry, a, a job. I, I have to say this. I, I hate you just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a year and a half into my postdoc, and I'm, you know, casting around for other postdocs. Like, <laughs> it's. <clears throat> It, there's an amazing amount of stochasticity, I would say, that it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some fit, yeah. Fit, fit is a is a very important thing, and it can be very yeah. hard to predict, and it's very nebulous, and um, people people say it, uh, but I don't think you really appreciate it until until you either are on a search committee or you get you get a job that you you know. Um, and you just wonder, and and you then you sort of, or you interview or whatever, and you sort of really realize what fit means. And yeah. so it's fit. Fit is not just like this consolation statement where people are like, "Oh, it's okay, you didn't get the job." It's <laughs> poor fit. It's like, well, some it's just it's this really weird thing. It's hard to predict. Um, so in, in my case, I think it was a really good fit between me and and the job. So when are you starting? Uh, September of twenty thirteen. Okay. So you're gonna you're gonna finish a cool. one year PhD. Uh, nice. Post-doc yeah. Then. Yeah, so that so there was a bit of um, uh, kind of so they want you bad. Shuffling. It's what it uh, translates to. They're I like I like to think very, that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, that's good. That's very good. I mean, yeah. speaking everything that you're saying is spot on. As somebody who's been on many search committees, um, you're looking. I mean, and honestly, that's also true when you're choosing a graduate student or a postdoc. Is you you want somebody who isn't going to drive everyone else crazy, and who has <laughs> No, seriously, you would be amazed at at how many times someone gets hired and it's like, who the hell is who picked this guy? What's up with that? You know, he runs just, with scissors. <laughs> or, 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 or just like, his gloves in the lab or outside the lab. <laughs> or even, you know, any given job description does may may or may not necessarily convey to you what the de- what the department is secretly looking yeah. for. And I've been on a couple yeah. search committees, so I have a sense of this as well. Um, and so yeah. it can be really interesting then to 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 think that you to to, to you have you have to be really careful not to oversell fit either, because then it makes you seem desperate. So don't take what I've said about fit and run out and be like, I am such a good fit for your department because I will teach whatever you want, and I. <laughs> Like, you can yeah. just over. You can really oversell it, and then that 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 looks really bad as well on applications. Um, you know, you have to be yourself 
Um, and I was joking before the podcast, before the recording started, that I actually had a lot of fun in my interview. I had a really good time just talking about science with people and mm -hmm. talking about teaching with people, and and everyone kind of has given me. When I told people that when I came back from my interview, and I was, and they were like, "How was it?" And I was like, "It was really fun." And if people were like, "What?" You know, they just didn't expect <laughs> that. And so. Um, who knows? Maybe it was fun because the fit was good, or maybe it was maybe I got the job mm -hmm. because I had fun. It's it's hard to know, but uh, I I think that yeah, I think that fit fits a hard thing to predict. Um, yeah, so luck. how many so how many positions did you apply for before you got this one? Uh, I so uh, I actually applied for the same job last year. <laughs> and then oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, and I changed a lot on my application between last year and this year. Um, actually found the professor is in was a really I don't know if you're familiar with that um, yeah. blog and slash her services um, as a professional mentor like uh, academic <laughs> mentor she helps she helps you with things you can pay for her services and, and get help with things like um, look, looking at your application materials doing mock mm -hmm. interviews things like that um, but she also has an incredible wealth of information on just on her blog um, one one of my favorite posts is stop acting like a grad student and yeah. uh, just sort of highlighting these things that we do that, that just make us seem very young academically. And so I changed a bunch of stuff on my application between the two years. That was fun. Um, and, then I, so I, and then I applied for another job, uh, which I um, shortlisted for and then withdrew. Um, so, 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 yeah, because I got the offer really early. I got it last in the beginning of October because they came out. They, they were doing interviews way ahead of the, of the pack. Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the nice things was I have two years of funding, so I didn't feel this urgency to apply to too many yeah. things. And so it, it also, I think, took the pressure off and made me feel very relaxed about the whole process. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, it's my it's, dream job, but if I didn't get it, there would be other good jobs someday. It's really amazing how much the search process is like dating. Hmm. So if you're incredibly desperate, you won't, <laughs> it will come across. It's Whether so true. trying to get, yeah, and so so if you're really comfortable with who you are and where you are, then you're able to to give good interview, uh, and. Um, Look <laughs> 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 at Morgan. <laughs> so, that was oh, the best interview. Very good interview. <laughs> Every time. Is that what they're calling it these days? <laughs> Man, that was a great interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never well, I said I had fun, that's anybody. not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, but it's, I mean, it is in, you know, that same sort of, could I have a relationship with, with this, in this case, department? Um, and looking for how good a, you know, are there, are there things that are compatible? Are they doing things that I think would drive me crazy? Um, mm. So it's, it's very similar in a lot of ways. Um, okay, I think it's similar. <laughs> no, I totally, I assume that it is. It seems to make sense from all I've seen and read. I mean, I haven't had any experience personally, but from the little bit of exposure I've had to interviewing, it seems like uh, that's the case. Yeah, I think, I think too that it gets back at this idea of imposter syndrome as well, where you... One of the, I mean, you have to learn how to talk yourself up. I mean, you have to, the language that you use in a cover letter is very different than the way in which we're used to writing, I mean, writing about ourselves. Most of us hate writing about ourselves, um, and yet you have to do it in, in, in such a way that, I mean, that comes across very confidently and very strongly and very effectively in your language, um, in, the, in the cover letter, in the, in the research statement. Um, and so, I mean, the, the, the first thing is even getting to the interview. Um, which is the, the sort of hoop number one. It's really, it's, getting a job is hard. Um, and I say that as someone who in two days will be officially unemployed. Uh, and uh, by choice, because I quit, because it wasn't a good fit. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean that, really, it was not a good fit. They were not, yeah, they, <laughs> they didn't get me, man. <laughs> um, so it's it's really hard to be able to say 
hi there, you've never met me, but I can solve all of your problems and needs. And <laughs> I'm awesome. So, so yeah. please, uh, <laughs> please choose me. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a very strange <laughs> exercise. But the thing that makes it, I find makes it a little bit easier is thinking really hard about what I'm good at and what I like to do. Um, and there's a difference between things that you're good at and you enjoy and really, really good at building websites, and it's a pain in the ass. But I keep getting sucked into it all the time because it's a really in-demand skill and it's also people pay you for it. Um, but it's not what I want to do with my life. And so you also have to do a little bit of hiding things. If there's stuff that you're really good at, but you don't want to make that the focus, then you have to kind of sweep that under a little bit too. So it's it's really an exercise in how well you know yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't done that that self-examination, then you might make it to the to the interview, but in the interview you're going to crash and burn because we'll ask you questions about yourself and what you want to do with yourself and where are you going to be in 5 years and you're going to be like I will be wherever you want me to be. Yeah. No wrong right. answer. Wrong. Or yeah. I'm actually, I've got a lot of fear about that, truthfully. I'm, a, I'm kind of on the job circuit now. And if, I mean, if you were to, if you were to label me uh, in baseball terms, I guess you might call me utility player. Like I, yeah. I, do, I do a lot of things, right? I'm a modeler. I, mm -hmm. I uh, have a good statistical background. Um, you know, I, I'm very good with computers. Uh, but... Mm -hmm. I don't have, you know, like, I, I haven't been interested in turtles since I was seven. Like, I don't fit into a box mm -hmm. in terms of research, right? And, you know, and the, well, no, well, like, <laughs> you're laughing, well, but what I mean is the people yeah, who have clearly well. defined research questions for a long yes. time, and yeah. they're really interested in that, and I don't do yeah. that. I'm, I yeah. just look at questions that interest me, right? And I, I actually think, I know, so I know a number of people who are, who get really jazzed up about methods and are really good at certain methods, whether it's statistical methods or modeling methods or whatever, but, um, and they have a harder time with the que with questions, and I think that that can sometimes hurt you, right, is you have to figure out a way in which mm -hmm. to present yourself as a question-driven person that those tools are especially well-suited to, to address. And, and so mm -hmm. one of the, I mean, I think people get nailed a lot, especially when I read... I've been reading a lot of my friends' um, cover letters and research statements, and it's all about the methods and it's all about the data, right? Here are my data. Here are my data sets. Here, you know, here, here are my tools. And uh, and if you don't come across as question driven, um, you know, even even if it's it doesn't have to be as focused as turtles, it can be as broad as, you know, I'm interested in the con you know the controls of, on community assembly and disassembly through time, or you know, some some broader question. Um, and then you can say, and, and then I use these awesome, you know, these kick-ass tools to address those kinds of questions. So you have to start with the questions first. And if you're not there, then you either have to get there or fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm a behavioral ecologist studying viruses right now. I mean, basically, my questions are evolution. You know? yeah. That's good. See, I think if Better you took Darwin, the beginning... <laughs> If you took your beginning statement and then slapped that evolutionary bit on the end, that would work great. Oh yeah, oh, but all ahead. these all these applications want like you know your detailed six year research plan with costs and you know what lab <laughs> facilities are getting. I'm like I I don't know like I don't know what I'm going to be doing in a week. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what were you going to say, Raphael? I was just going to say that at the same time, I mean the the expertise that you've you've acquired so far allows you to pretty much tackle any question you want. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's just a matter of deciding on something. Turtle you really like. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's why I really my like turtle. the... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's my turtle. That's why I like it. My academic spirit guide. <laughs> Wait, okay, I, I have, I have one more question that I want to ask that goes way, way back, but I, I, I'm really curious. Okay, hit <laughs> it. So, Jacqueline, you were, you were saying that you did that experiment about with the first funding hashtag to, to show to NSF, mm -hmm. um, you know, the power of so, so, social media and engaging communication and stuff. Mm -hmm. What was their reaction? What was their response? What was NSF's reaction? Yeah. Oh, um, 
I I think so. NSF is really interested in um, in, in using social media, uh, particularly to try to. Um, and I was speaking specifically to people in the um, the DEB, um, the Environmental Biology mm -hmm. Group, and um, there are some folks there who are tweeting, including some um, uh, POs, and uh, and are using social media. But they're really interested in using and in using. Um, social media to create a two-way conversation that yeah. allows them to communicate and also uh, create conversation around um, the process of funding. So sort of, so if you look at, there's a really great example, um, uh, Rocky Talks, Ali Rocky's uh, blog for the NIH, mm -hmm. where they, the, the blog is, it's not about here are the cool projects NIH has funded. Um, it's not a dissemination of that kind of information. It's here are the, the the funding structures. Here's why we have them set up the way that they are. Here are here's data on who we're funding in terms of early career researchers or gender diversity things like that. Um, and we, and here you know we'd like to hear your thoughts about um, how this process is working. And so for example with DEB they recently went to a two page pre proposal process that if you made that so it's a one a one year funding cycle or if you made a pre proposal process. Then you would be invited to give this um, full proposal, um, and then you would find out if you were funded. So it, it basically, instead of having two full proposal um, deadlines, you only have one pre-proposal and then a full proposal if you make it. And that last year was the first year that it was it was announced, and it was basically announced rather quickly, um, and without uh, uh, without a lot of um, sort of foreshadowing, I guess. And so people were kind of taken aback and a bit frustrated. And there, there's been quite a bit of of, of unsolicited feedback from the broader science community and um, so sort of one example of where of an opportunity where a two-way conversation could have come out um, but but didn't and so NSF is really interested in um, in creating space for a conversation and so I think they were very excited to see the ways in which things like Twitter and blogging were, were being used by um, other funding agencies and also could be used as a way to sort of promote these kinds of conversations. Because NSF, the people at NSF, you have to realize, are really actually, they're, they're, they're conscious of these issues, right? They're, they're aware of the, of, the, of the problems or possible limitations, but they also themselves are facing issues with a, a high reviewer burden and, and it's getting more and more difficult for people, for them to get reviewers um, and uh, so they're so they're they're trying to work under these real real limitations, and also they have re restrictions as a federal agency. For example, you cannot ask for advice from the public without going through an extensive process. If you're if you're associated with the federal government, you have to and you want to ask for advice, you have to go through an extensive um, approval process, and there's a lot of red tape associated with that. So it's not like you can just write a, a simple blog post like I would write, or, or, or like I did with Twitter, where I asked, you know, I started the first grant hashtag and said, hey guys, what's your advice mm -hmm. for first grant writers? You know, for NSF to do that, they'd have to have all of that, you know, pre-approved, since they're soliciting, you know, feedback from the general public. Mm -hmm. However, you know, if you have a blog post where you say, Here's what we're doing and why, and you and you turn on comments, you enable comments. That's not technically asking for advice. So where you know, so a lot of it falls down to you know what is what's the legal advice on how that works. And so having examples like um, Sally Rocky's NIH blog, and there are a couple of other blogs um, through different NSF or through different um, federal agencies like the um, uh, EPA, um, even like the National Archivist has a blog. So there there's some good examples that I think will help to create a legal precedence for NSF to be able to do this. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, of figuring out the logistics, but they're super eager to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, does anybody else have any other questions for Jacqueline before we let her go somewhere? Uh, no, I, I, have I, I a... do have one if, if we don't have time. But apparently there's two between myself and Bug, so Bug, you can go first. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say that the questions going towards NSF, though, from um, potential grant awardees, I guess, would be the... Um, I've found NSF program officers to be incredibly willing to chat with me. Um, oh, yeah. And really accessible. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize, um, especially yeah. grad students and postdocs, that um, they're very happy to say, this is exactly what we are looking for, X, Y, Z, and if, if you have this in your proposal, it's a total non-starter. Um, so they're very willing to talk to you and share with you, just as usually 
if you have a good faculty member, they'll show you a grant and say, this is a grant that worked, this is one that didn't, here's, you know, here's the commentary. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not, it's, it's a lot of work to do a grant with NSF um, and, and with USDA as well, um, but it's not impossible and it's not a secret. They'll share yeah. information with you. And with funding That's rates at like less than eight, you know, around eight, hovering around eight percent. I mean, calling a program officer and pitching them your idea and getting feedback is a really important step. And and you know, thing, things like having um, preliminary data can be can really make or make or break your proposal. Um, and so, yeah, there are there are definitely things that you can do to sort of increase your odds as much as possible. Yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering because I mean, usually usually when I go to conferences, there's like always an NSF pa panel, and yeah. they're super open to discussing you know the current state of funding and things like that, and tips on grant writing and stuff. So I was kind of wondering why they didn't do that more through Twitter. And when you mm -hmm. when you brought that up, I thought that was very you know, I thought that was the direction that they they were taking it and. Yeah, so I was curious right. to see what how they were how they reacted to it. Yeah, right now I think all the as far as I know I could be wrong. The all the NSF hand, handles um, on Twitter are are bots. They're they're mm -hmm. they're broadcasting content, so there's no one responding. Um, so soon you know they might be linked to a blog or something sort of sort of automated content. Um, but there are a number of program officers like Alan Townsend is one who are um, who are on Twitter and you know they will indicate that. Um, Lisa Bausch, I just met, uh, read, you know, was at this Paleo 50 workshop with her. Um, so there are people who are POs who are using Twitter actively, sort of as themselves. Um, but tw uh, but NSF itself has not got people behind those those Twitter accounts yet. So yeah, so one of the, I mean, one of the, and just like with scientists, one of the big um, the parts of the discussion was showing people how it's it can be effective. It's a you have to decide it's important. B um, you have to. Uh, here, here are the ways in which you can minimize the, the the amount of time you spend on it while maximizing your effectiveness. Um, because people really think of social media as this big vortex of a, of of like time lost, but it can yeah. actually it can actually be a big productivity enhancer. I think. So before Tom falls completely asleep, I've just got one more question. <laughs> comment kind of thing. Um, so this summer, you said you defended your PhD this summer, and you did something that was kind of unusual, uh, and you uh, live casted it. Um, and I, I actually happened to watch, because uh, I thought it was really cool that you were doing that. So did you have much um, pushback from department or your advisors or any of your committees about doing that? Because I know if I had brought that up with my committee, they'd be like, well, are you retarded? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's just a big, I mean, it's pretty stigma, stigmatized against doing anything like that, and especially to have it open to the public like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so for me, I where it all started was that two of my committee members were, were remote. One was doing field work in Hawaii, and the other one was at the University of Wyoming. And so from a practical standpoint, I needed to be able to present to them my um, seminar. And so the feedback I got from Twitter <laughs> was that Skype would be would, was a bad idea, that it was too unreliable, and um, and that they had had success. People had, in the past had had success using UStream, um, and so I uh, I decided to look into UStream. And then all of a sudden, a few people were like, "Well, if you do that, you know, send me the link too, because I want to watch." And I was like, "Really? All right." And so then I decided to sort of take the open science approach and jump in and uh, got, you know, sort of got, got some feedback from my advisor first. Um, but my advisor, Jack Williams, um, has recently been getting more in, into social media. He's on Twitter as Ice Age Ecologist. And, uh, and he, he, he went to the um, Aldo Leopold Leadership Workshop uh, like a year and a half ago. And so, so I was very lucky that my advisor was really supportive of this. You know, he basically said, you know, keep in mind that some of your committee members might think it's a little weird, but um, he was he was really supportive. And um, I had someone fielding questions. Um, there were about a hundred people, I think, max um, at the on the Ustream feed. Um, and wow. some questions were fielded from from that. Some questions were fielded from Twitter because someone was live tweeting the defense. And I think. Uh, I like to think that it, um, 
I mean, my department was really supportive. I will say they 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 thought it was a really cool idea. They're you know eager to do more stuff like this. Um, but I like to think that just the fact that the doing it itself was so successful in terms of its um, how uh, how engaged it, people were. Um, like just just the fact that someone was like, I have a question from Twitter, and they were able to ask that question and then you know type it in. I think that other faculty and members of, of my committee were able to see that as as more more of a um, it's kind of a. I think it added some legitimacy to it, right? That I was able to. Mm -hmm. They were able to see that that was there, there was a smart question that came from from Twitter, and that this was you know opening it up to a broader sort of a broader audience. Um, and then of course the there was a like a four hour closed portion of my defense um, that happened afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the and and we do give public talks um, in my department, but this was the first live streamed one. Yeah. I just thought it was I thought it was really cool and, and you you did really really well you handled yourself really well and and oh, uh, I just thought it was it was very cool and I, I had actually been thinking of trying to convince my faculty to let me do something similar when I finish up so there's that nice awesome. president set yeah I, so. I mean I, I encourage it I mean I it's uh again just as a as an open science exercise and also as a, a form of outreach um, and what was cool is apparently, so someone was monitoring the Ustream feed. The person who was behind the camera was one of the postdocs um, in my lab. Um, he's also on Twitter, S.J. Goring. Um, he was sort of, there. Were, I guess there were some, some kind of technical questions that people had, and other people were answering them. So if there was a term that people didn't understand, other people in the feed were kind of addressing it. And um, and so I thought that was kind of neat, too, because if that is really you know, cool. like my mom was on the feed and probably saying things like, Oh my god, I'm so proud of my daughter, or whatever. But if someone else was like, "Wait, I don't get it. What's a what's an NMDS or whatever?" Then someone could be like, "Oh, it's well, I don't know what they would say to, that, <laughs> to someone who didn't know." But uh, yeah, anyway, I, I I found it really positive. Actually, it was probably uh, it, it it made it. You know, people people told me to look forward to being really disappointed by my defense that. It was. It would be this moment you sort of build up to after all this time, and then it happens, and then it's kind of it's kind of a deflation because it's not a big deal. You don't really feel like you've accomplished something. You sort of just feel like nothing's changed. But I would really? say that to hell yeah, with a that. lot of a lot of people yeah, told me that that's... they said like, you know, yeah. it's it just you have this big build up, and then and then you don't really feel like anything's happened. You know, you just give your give your seminar to to, to and then you you know you, you have your defense, and then you're done, and. Uh, and I actually didn't feel like that was the case at all for me. And I think that having having this broader community of support, I think, was a big part of that. I was wearing a underneath the sweater I was wearing. I was wearing a shirt that said "Not that kind of doctor." And at the end of my defense, I just ripped it off and ran out of the room screaming. <laughs> you know. the, the entire ensemble, or just the sweater? Because that's just the sweater. <laughs> okay. I was sending a message. You know. but, but no, I I. Felt great at the end of mine. Awesome, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe it depends on how you approach it. Yeah. Well, I found it found it interesting because I know that a lot of different schools approach defenses in a lot of different ways. Um, like, at, for instance, in my school, not only is the presentation open, so anybody can sit on that, but so are both question rounds afterwards. Ooh. So uh, you can have you know an entire audience for when you get thrown over the coals. Um, and so it's, I, I find it really interesting seeing how other schools and other departments, you know, handle these sorts of things just for my own sake and seeing whether these are things that I, that I would be glad to have or not to have um, at my institution and also for the future, you know, gives me exposure for, because I'm doing all my grad work at the same university, it's giving me this exposure to how other universities run, which I can yeah. take with me down my way, down the way, so. Totally. Uh, anyways, I just thought cool. They don't do defenses out here. They don't at all, like hmm. ever. I think the UK is the same, so, isn't it? No, so what do not they exactly. Do? No, you you guys do oral defenses. Uh, yeah, but it's it's an enclosed one, so you just have your an internal examiner who's someone from your department that you've not worked with, and an external, and it's called a viva, and they just ask you lots of tough questions, but it's not open to the public or anything. Mm. It's like the world's worst job interview. Mm. <laughs> I would imagine I never got that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Brazil, the defenses are always open. In all all the universities I know of, like both the the question round is open to the public too. 
which is good when you're you know preparing to do that because you get to see what it's like. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like it's it's a it's you're you're if you don't if you have completely closed defenses, you're missing an opportunity to show other students what to expect. You're missing an opportunity for the department and the university to say, look at all the cool stuff we're doing, right, and to the broader mm -hmm. public. So I I don't I don't. I don't. I can't think of a compelling reason why, at least to keep the talk portion closed. Um, I can understand why they might want to keep the question, the grilling question part closed, um, and especially because you know it can, it can run on for hours and hours, and it gets you know there's a lot of technical stuff. But um, yeah, it just I can't. You know, we keep talking about all these things we want to do to to promote science and to for outreach and all this other stuff, and it's like here's a really easy thing to do and. Um, I mean, it, why not do it? I can't. I can't think why. I think mine was technically open, but nobody nobody cared enough to come. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. It helps uh, having an awesome poster. My husband made me a really <clears throat> cool poster that looked like a National Geographic cover. So, oh yeah, I saw that. I think that helped. <laughs> actually, mine was arranged in like a week, and then you know, because yeah. I'd actually landed this position here, and I needed to get everything done in a hurry, Ooh. and so. Um, yeah, that's 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 the reason for why nobody came. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, um, <laughs> that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a friendless loser. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I I am actually gonna put a halt to this here because it's getting on <laughs> in the UK where they are. Yeah. And, Tom's going to fall asleep and die. <laughs> <laughs> and Lauren's looking a little droopy, too. So Yeah, uh, I've, I've worn myself out. It was all the talk of cloning mammoths. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> we kind of peaked early, I think, energy, that energy. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for Lauren to use her uh, special telephone voice to ask Jacqueline if uh, she enjoyed this interview. <laughs> 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 uh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, Jacqueline. Yeah. <laughs> Watch argument. about four episodes back and you'll understand why that... Um, okay. Jacqueline, I hope, I hope <laughs> you've had a lovely interview. I hope it was as good for you as it was for us. Oh, it was, definitely. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, we'll, uh, <laughs> all right, so we'll, we'll call that a close. So... Thank you all for joining us for episode 13 of the Breaking Mile podcast, and everybody can wave goodbye and have a good night. <laughs>